Watch this. Today was the first step of the Latah County legal process to try to convict the killer of four University of Idaho students now nearly two months ago. 28 year old Brian Koberger was in court this morning for his arraignment after landing in Idaho from Pennsylvania yesterday evening. Morgan Romero is live in Moscow right now where the proceedings lasted long enough for Koberger to hear the charges against him. Morgan. Yeah, initial appearances, Brian, are usually typically very short, but we did learn a lot of new information from a probable cause affidavit that was unsealed just about an hour before that appearance this morning. It was 18 pages long. It was super detailed. It gave the most information that we've ever seen in this court case, and what it showed is that investigators have been watching Brian Koberger since very early on in the investigation, about two weeks after the murders on November 13th. Brian Koberger had his first court appearance in this building behind me today, the Latah County Courthouse, which also serves as the jail. We had to get here really early in the morning because his court hearing wasn't set yesterday when he arrived from Pennsylvania. It was set this morning and we didn't know. So a long line of media was in the lobby this morning, his hearing at 930 Pacific time. He faces four counts of first degree murder and one burglary charge. He's accused of unlawfully entering the King Road home where the crimes happened with the intent to commit murder. If he's found guilty, he could face the death penalty or or life in prison. He was also issued a no contact order with the victim's families. He was also appointed a public defender and the judge set no bail. At this point in time, pursuant to Idaho Criminal 46B and Idaho Code 18, excuse me, 19-816 and 2903, I am going to leave uh, the bail set at this case as no bail at this point in time um, until I have additional or further information um, at a later date and time. His next hearing is January 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific. It's going to be a status hearing, and at that time, they'll set the next hearing, the preliminary hearing. As you can see in the video, he was wearing an orange jumpsuit in court. Our Alexandra Duggan was in the courtroom when he was there. I was in the overflow room since there were so many people. She says he showed little emotion as the charges were read against him from the judge. He looked tense, though. He is, uh, his public defender also said that he has a strong family and his family stands behind him. Along with the defendant and the prosecutors and the, defend, the defendant's public defender, Kaylee Gonsalves, one of the victims, her family was in the courtroom and their attorney gave a short statement after the hearing saying that the family is in it for the long haul. I want to go through that probable cause affidavit I mentioned earlier. We're going to lay out some of the details that we learned from that today, but I do want to note that investigators were able to connect Brian Koberger with the scene of the crime through DNA, video surveillance, showing his car and cell phone records. So here is what we know. Zana and Ethan were found on the second floor and Maddie and Kaylee were found in bed together on the third floor. That's what the PCA shows. Officers noticed a tan leather knife sheath on the bed next to Maddie. A sheath is a cover for the blade of a knife. They figured out it was a K-bar knife with a Marine Corps insignia. The Idaho State Lab found a single source of male DNA on the button of that sheath, which they call the suspect profile. They then compared that DNA to trash that they took from the Koberger family home in Pennsylvania on December 27th. As you heard Brian mention, he came from Pennsylvania. That's where he was arrested at his family home. So investigators matched the DNA of the suspect's father from that trash almost 100 percent to the DNA on that knife sheath. The affidavit also shows two surviving roommates said everyone was home by 2 a.m. and in their rooms by 4 a.m. on the morning of the murders, November 13th, except for Zana Kernodal, one of the victims who got a DoorDash order delivered at 4 a.m. Officers say Kaylee Gonsalves' dog was there at the time of the crime. She's heard barking several times on security footage from a neighboring home. One roommate who survived says she was woken up around 4 a.m. by noise on the third floor above her. She said it sounded like Kaylee playing with her dog. She heard one of her roommates say there's someone here. Investigators say this could have been Zana because she was likely awake and on TikTok at the time. The surviving roommate says she opened her door when she heard crying coming from Zana's room. And then she heard a man say, it's OK, I'm going to help you. The roommate says she opened her door again. She saw a person in black wearing a mask covering their mouth and nose. She described him as tall, 
not muscular, but with an athletic build and had bushy eyebrows. So this is the first we are hearing that the surviving roommate, one of the two surviving roommates, also saw the suspect in this case. The roommate says he walked past her and she stood in a frozen shock phase. He then left. Investigators believe the homicides happened between 4 and 425 a.m. 911 was called around noon, so several hours after the murders allegedly happened from one of the roommate's phones inside the home. Investigators have reviewed several surveillance videos throughout this, and they say surveillance video from the area showed a white Hyundai Elantra seen near the crime scene multiple times around the time of the murders. Then on November 29th, Washington State U Police University, excuse me, Washington State University Police learned Brian Koberger owned a white Hyundai Elantra. The physical description from his driver's license matched the one that the roommate gave. Koberger, as we've been reporting as a PhD student in criminology at Wazoo, investigators got search warrants for his cell phone records. His phone did not ping towers near the King Road house because investigators believe he turned it off, but it did ping on its way to Moscow and back to Pullman after the murders. His phone records also match the movements of the Hyundai Elantra as seen on surveillance video. Officers also later learned through cell phone records that Koberger had been by the King Road home at least 12 times leading up to the murders in the months before the murders in the late evening hours or in the early morning hours. So Brian, again, just learning so many new details today as he made his first appearance in court. All right, a lot more expected to be coming out, although we won't hear from anyone involved in this case, but we'll wait and see what other court proceedings happen to glean any sort of other information. Thank you very much, Morgan. I really appreciate that. You report live from Moscow. Okay, so as Morgan said and touched on, the probable cause affidavit released today gave us a whole lot of detail as to what happened in those early morning hours on November 13th, both in and around the King Road House and all the way to Pullman, Washington, 10 miles away. The affidavit is the statement of Corporal Brent Payne, a four-year veteran at the Moscow Police Department. Corporal Payne arrived at the King Road House that Sunday morning, November 13th, or th Sunday afternoon, excuse me, on November 13th, around four in the afternoon. For the next four pages of that affidavit or so, he described what he saw at the scene and what he was told by the surviving roommates. The DNA that you heard Morgan talk about that was found on the sheath snap, uh, the snap of the sheath that was found in the bed next to Maddie, obviously one of the biggest breaks in the case. The others, as you also heard Morgan mention, the white Hyundai Elantra owned and driven by Koberger and his cell phone, both with links to his parents in Pennsylvania. The car had Pennsylvania plates until five days after the murder. That was when Koberger allegedly or did change his tags, I should say, registering his Elantra in Whitman County, Washington, where he was going to school at Washington State. However, within the school, it was still registered as being from Pennsylvania. His phone, Corporal Payne later learned, was also under his parents' AT&T account in Pennsylvania. And it was these two pieces of information, along with those security and traffic cameras in the area, a police officer's instinct about unusual neighborhood traffic and that cell phone showing up on area towers that helped Moscow police by December 23rd know they had their man and his whereabouts that morning. At 3.26 a.m., a white Hyundai Elantra was seen in Moscow on security cameras, and it was seen on Indian Hills Drive here. And it was followed at 3.26, so by the time it got to about 3.28, he was seen at the intersection of Steiner Road and Highway 95. We assume he went across the street, made it onto Taylor Avenue, and made it in the general area of King Road a few minutes later. That's because at around 4.04, a white Hyundai Elantra was seen multiple times kind of in this area, starting at about 3.29 till about 4.20. What they saw on some of these security cameras was this car pull up here onto King Road, then pull onto Queen Road here, and then eventually make it to this apartment complex, turn around, come back to the intersection at Queen and King, make a three-point turn, turn back around, and find some parking somewhere in this area. Because then what happened was at 420, later that morning, just about 15 minutes later, a white Hyundai Elantra was seen speeding out of the area of the King Road apartment complex. Then beginning at about 525, a white Hyundai Elantra or a sedan that looks just like that was seen on five different security cameras coming through Pullman and also into the Washington State campus. First seen coming up Johnson Road here, then where it hits Bishop, and then onto Stadium Way and made its way into the Washington State campus. It passed Grimes, as we zoom in here and show you there, there's Nevada Street. It went past Grimes, it was picked up there, it was picked up at Wilson, which is right there, and then it continued all the way around. If you follow this away, it picked up on Cougar just a few minutes later. That road continues all the way around Stadium Way 
up to the right, up Valley Road, and then you turn up this place here, right here. This would be the Steptoe Apartments, the home of 28-year-old Brian Koberger in this apartment complex right there. 12 days later, on November 25th, the Moscow Police Department asked area law enforcement to be on the lookout for a white Hyundai Elantra. On November 29th, Washington State University Police found a 2015 Hyundai Elantra registered to a student, a 28-year-old Brian Koberger, who's a criminology student, a graduate criminology student studying at Washington State. His car was found about a half hour later on that November 29th, right here in this parking lot. His driver's license picture and the information also matched the roommate's description of the man she saw in the house the morning of the murders. That pushed Moscow police to look into Koberger's cell phone data, a number they got after pulling him over for a traffic violation in August. So that brings us to the cell phone data, kind of corroborate what they saw on traffic cameras. So that starts here at 2.42 a.m. on November 13th, the morning of the murders. That cell phone pinged in the area of the Steptoe Village Apartments where Koberger lives. At 2.47, it picks him up leaving his apartment complex and driving south through Pullman on its way, we assume, to Highway 270, which takes you to Moscow. That's this map here. It turns off at 2.47. It doesn't ping on any more cell phone towers. Then two hours later at 4.48, that cell phone pops up again on a cell phone tower just north of Genesee near Blaine in this area. And for the next few minutes or so from 4.50 to 5.26, they tracked it moving west toward Uniontown, then back north as it made its way back to Pullman. And then at about 5.30, that cell phone once again pings in Pullman right here on Johnson and Bishop as it made its way back into Pullman and onto the Washington State campus. Hopefully you're able to follow that. And it's worth mentioning this again, Morgan already mentioned it once, but later that day, according to cell phone data, Kohlberger's phone also showed up in the area of the King Road House. Later that day of the murders, November 13th at 9 a.m., it showed him leaving his apartment and arriving around King Road between 912 and 921. By 932, it showed him back at his apartment in Pullman. So he apparently returned to the scene of the crime the very next morning. Well, I guess just a few hours later. And this wasn't the only time Koberger's phone showed up near the King Road house. A wider historical record request of Koberger's phone showed he visited the area of King Road 12 times prior to the murders, all but one late in the evening or in the early morning hours. One of those times was late August 21st, around 1130 in the evening, 1130 p.m., when he was pulled over by a Lataw County Sheriff's deputy, where he gave his cell phone number to that deputy. To read the full probable cause affidavit, you can watch the full arraignment as well from this morning and read all of our coverage. Just head to our website at ktvb.com. We will also continue this to follow this, obviously, and bring you more coverage from Moscow coming up in our later newscast tonight and coming in the next several days. For the latest information, as I said, follow us on social, on our website, ktvb.com, and the KTVB app.
Days away, and they are set for action down at the Idaho State House. Monday, lawmakers are going to return for the State of the State address and then, well, get to work for the 2023 legislative session. A lot of new faces and new places, especially in some of those committee rooms. How it will play out, we'll have to wait and watch, obviously. But we do know there are topics lawmakers are ready to jump on. Two of those, education, property taxes. Chief political reporter Joe Paris shares a preview of, uh, from the, of those things from a Boise State politics expert as well as thoughts on the education and property taxes from House leadership. Here we are, the precipice of the 2023 Idaho legislative session. 2022 was full of elections and now those elected are ready to take action. And there's a lot of new faces. Boise State politics expert Dr. Stephanie Wett sets the tone. This new legislature has a different dynamic. Well, a lot of new faces, um, and so you don't know what the new people are going to be like till you see them in action. So that's, that's a big question, and of course we have many new committee chairs, and the committee chairs hold a lot of power in terms of which bills get into the process and what are considered. So uh, those, are, those are a couple things I think that we're looking at right off the bat. Lawmakers and political experts agree. Education in Idaho will be a major legislative topic. It is. Of course, the special session allocated uh, $410 million uh, for education, but it did not specify exactly how that should be spent and on what kinds of issues. So uh, that's a topic the legislature will have to pick up. Of course, the legislature does not have to honor that. They can change their mind, change the dollar amount, change the focus. So. That's all uh, yet to be seen. Assistant Minority Leader, Democrat Representative Lauren Nekachea says, Democrats are following the GOP sentiment mentioned last session of fund students, not systems, closely. I'm very concerned about all of this talk about school vouchers, which would siphon funds away from public schools to private schools where there's no accountability and no oversight, and we can't as taxpayers make sure that uh, those school, those children are getting um, what they need to succeed. Um, and I'm even more concerned in this era where our public and charter schools we fund with public dollars aren't getting the funds they need. So there's no, there are no extra dollars to take away from them. Majority Leader Republican Representative Megan Blanksma says GOP members of the House are focused on education options for Idahoans. I think what our focus on education is going to be is less on um, the facilities and current systems and more on workforce development. I think that's where we're finding a shortcoming and we had done some town halls around the state earlier or at the end of last year, um, to try to figure out what business is needed for a workforce. And so I would look for some more targeted education investment when it comes to workforce development. I think that that is going to be more of a focus this year. Property tax is another major issue Idahoans have spoken up on. They've called on leaders around Idaho to fix the reality of booming property tax rates. Democrats have consistently <laughs> um, um, advocated for re-indexing re our homeowners exemption so it goes up with home prices. In 2016, when the Republicans capped that homeowners exemption instead of letting it go up with home prices, every Democrat voted against it because we predicted exactly the scenario that we see today where homeowners are seeing their property taxes going up year after year after year. Blanksmith says yes, lawmakers want to do what they can to address property tax issues, but the reality is local government needs to make changes. The state does not levy property tax, the state does not collect property tax, and the state does not spend property tax. And I understand people are hurting based upon their property tax bills, but this is a very serious local problem. Property tax goes to your local entities. We have, I think um, Representative Harris said it best last year, we have a whole lot of levers with the taxes that we collect on a state level, but we have very few to address property tax. Now I know we're looking at ways to shift money to try to give some property tax relief as best we can, but what people really need to focus on are those local budgets. So we are expecting a lot of action over the next several days. Of course, tomorrow will be the inauguration over at the State House. We'll see a lot of the new state executives signed into power. Uh, of course, on Monday, the governor's state of the state, and Brian, from there, it's away we go. And there's a lot that we're expecting to get into over the next several months, but uh, Monday officially kicks it off. What's interesting is that there's a lot of people out there clamoring for the state to get involved in what usually is local control, whether that's education, which is all local control. I mean, funding comes from the state, yes, but it also comes from property taxes. And then the other side of that is property taxes. That's also done at a local level, but there's a lot of call for people at the state level to say, fix it, do something. But it's all local. 
And so how can they get into that? And, and it's difficult, too, because to be honest, and not to insult anyone, but there's a lot of people that pay property taxes that might not fully understand exactly how they work, and that's okay. You should look into it, but you know, some people, frankly, don't. So property taxes, for the most part, at, at the local level, there's a lot of spending and there's bonds and levies that we talk about that can drive those up. So what lawmakers can do at the state level could be limited. However, there are, you know, there are things like the homeowner's exemption, which you heard Representative Necochea talk about, and those are the types yeah. of things that Democrats are talking about. What can we do from this level to kind of help the burden. At the same time, though, you'll hear Republican lawmakers like Representative Blanksman, we just heard from her, saying that, look, we can only go so far. You need to talk to your local officials and talk to them about how they're spending at the local level and kind of where your money's going. So it'll be a very interesting conversation. It'll probably be similar to what we've seen over the last few years. But again, there might be new solutions. With so many new members of the legislature, so much new blood. Touching on that, yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say, a lot of new members. But we expected going to last session some volatility. Are we seeing that really quickly if that's going to be kind of the case this year? You know, there's a number of lawmakers that we've seen a little bit of a preview on social media sure. on how they might handle some of their business. To, to be honest, though, we really don't know what a lot of these new lawmakers will do or how the, the older or the more senior lawmakers will be doing that as well. So we'll find out starting Monday. Yep. Buckle up, buckaroos. We'll be right back.
Final moments of the show, your comments. A couple of questions today about the probable cause affidavit in regards to the Moscow murders that happened on November 13th, like this one from Kelly Goff. What was the burglary charge against Brian Kohlberger for, uh, is that information not being released? Well, actually, it was when they announced it, it is a burglary charge because the definition of burglary is entering a place illegally with the intent to commit a crime. So they're saying he in entered the house with the intent to commit murder. So that's why he's being charged with burglary. If the officials were on top of Kohlberger's car, why didn't they have the license plates? Well, they made that clear. They didn't have any plates on any of those cameras. They couldn't see a plate. But it's worth noting that he still had Pennsylvania plates on that car when the crime was committed, supposedly, allegedly committed. They don't require a front license plate, so they were not able to see one. It wasn't until five days later that he put Washington plates on that car, so he had two plates on there. So they didn't really have access to that information when they apparently got these uh, these pictures, these security camera videos to show a car, a white car, moving in and about these areas. One other thing, we saw a lot of comments about the roommate. Why hasn't the roommate, didn't the roommate come forward earlier to say something when she saw a man in the house in the early morning hours wearing a mask, wearing all black? Try to put yourself in that situation of a 20-year-old college girl and scared at 4 a.m. in the morning. You could say you would do something, but I don't know. Might have to give her a little grace in this one.